This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Well, at the end of our previous session, we saw how it was we would deal with the taxability of our savings income. How we would firstly apply, if applicable, the 0% starting rate band that could be as high as £5,000, and thereafter the savings income nil rate band, which of course was either available if you were a basic rate taxpayer at a level of £1,000, or reduced to £500 if you were a higher rate taxpayer. Nothing at all available if you're an additional rate taxpayer. Now, all the examples that we did in class together, uh, here on the screen, uh, we're dealing with basic rate taxpayers. I've left you examples two through to example five for you to have a go at. And what I want to do is just have a look at, look at this answer to example three there, because this was the first time you come across the situation with savings and non-savings income of the taxpayer being a higher rate taxpayer. So I wonder how you got on. So I thought we'd just have a quick review of this. Now again, we can pick up all the figures nice and simply from the question. We've got trading income assessment for the year, £26,850 going in there. We have our bank deposit interest of 20000 So we've got non-savings and savings as we'd identify them to be. The personal allowance, of course, is allocated firstly against your non-savings income. And clearly the non-savings income is more than sufficient to absorb all the personal allowance. So we end up with taxable income figures of 15,000 for non-savings, 20,000 for savings, a total of 35,000 pounds, therefore. Now, you stop and think at that point in time. Re your savings income and the rates of tax that will be applicable to it. What do we know? First of all, we know that all of the non-savings income falls within the basic rate band. So it will be taxed at 20%. But £15,000 is more than 5000 which means that there will be no 0% starting rate band available in relation to your £20,000 of taxable savings income. That savings income starting rate band of 0% would only be available if this figure of taxable income on your non-savings, if that did not exceed £5,000. We only get the starting rate band if any part of that savings, taxable savings income, falls within the first £5,000 of your total taxable income. As we tax firstly non-savings before it, that is most definitely not the case here. So we've learnt that from that figure. There'll be no starting rate band available for the savings income. Then we look at that figure. 35,000, just above 34,500, which is, of course, our basic rate band limit. So that has pushed this taxpayer up into the higher rate band. Therefore, as a higher rate taxpayer, our taxpayer will only enjoy a savings income nil rate band of £500. So when it comes to taxing now our savings income, there's no starting rate band. Again, if we look at here, the 0% starting rate for savings income is not applicable for the reason that we've just stated, looking at the non-savings taxable income figure of 15,000. We know, however, that there is, albeit the reduced 500 pounds level, of savings income nil rate band. Why? Because that figure makes our taxpayer a higher rate taxpayer. So those two figures ringed there the non-savings taxable income and the total taxable income are critical in knowing, one, whether there'll be any 0% starting rate band available for the savings income, and two, what, if any, will be the level of uh, savings income nil rate band available. We can then see that as 35,000 is... £500 above the basic rate band limit, that of the remaining £19,500 of savings income, the first 19000 of that stays within the basic rate band, added up 15000 plus 500, so 15000 plus 500 is 15 and a half, plus 19, well that's going to be 34500 
So 19,000 of the taxable savings income is within the basic rate band, so it's taxed at 20%. It pushes 500 pounds up into the higher rate band. We knew that because we got 35,000 in total. And the top slice here in the absence of any dividend income is savings income. So that 500 is at 40%. Make sure you've read through those notes, you've understood that therefore before we move on. And where we move on to is now bring in the last piece in the jigsaw of computing taxable income and then computing our figure of tax thereon. And that is to deal with our dividend income. So back to your notes in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 22, it'll be a while before we get there, in chapter 2, and we look at dividend income here, where we left off last time. Now we know that we only tax the taxable dividend income after we've taxed firstly the non-savings and then the savings income. And after that, the taxable dividend income will also firstly benefit from a 0%, a dividend income nil rate band. As well as having a savings income nil rate band, we have a dividend income nil rate band, which for the tax year 2018-19 has been reduced down to 2,000. It was 5,000 before that, but now it's just 2,000 pounds in the 18-19 tax year. But hey, if it's uh, anything at a 0%, we'll be grateful for it. So the first £2,000 of dividend income received will be, uh, again, taxed at the 0% rate. And here, it is not impacted by whether you are a basic rate, a higher rate, or an additional rate taxpayer. With the savings income nil rate band, you only got £1,000 if you're a basic rate taxpayer. You got just 500, as we've just seen, if you're a higher rate taxpayer. And if you're an additional rate taxpayer, it isn't getting any at all. Not so with the dividend income nil rate band. Every taxpayer with a basic, higher or additional rate, they'll all benefit from this £2,000 dividend income nil rate band. It's available irrespective of whether dividends fall within the basic rate, higher rate or additional rate after which the dividend tax rates are as follows. So, if after taxing non-savings, savings, then to dividend, you've taken out the first 2,000 and charged it to tax, remember it counts towards your basic and higher rate band limits. You've taxed that first 2,000 at 0%. If any of the remaining, if there is any remaining taxable dividend income, if that falls within the basic rate band, then it's a mere 7.5% tax rate that is to be charged. Soon, of course, as you go above the basic rate band limited to higher rate, it gets rather more serious. And we see there 32.5% will be the tax rate where you fall any part of your taxable dividend income falling into the higher rate band. Does only get any better, of course, when you move up into additional rate, but by the time you get to additional rate, you should be okay. Uh, dividends falling in, oops, well, hopefully by the time you uh, get to see this, this will be corrected. That, of course, falling in the additional. Hopefully the version you're looking at has already had that corrected. In the additional rate band there at 38.1%. An odd percentage, again, don't you have to, don't have to worry the history that lies behind these tax rates. There's reasons for that, but those are the tax rates that you apply. So after you've done the first 2000 at the nil rate, which you get whatever level of taxpayer you are, the remaining taxable dividend income, if any part of it, the first bit of it falls within the basic rate band, 7.5. Any part of it then in the higher rate, 32.5. Any part of it thereafter above £150,000, a lot of dividends, falling into the additional rate band, that would be up to 38.1%. Again, remember what we said, the dividend nil rate band counts towards the basic rate and higher rate limits. You don't just ignore the first 2000 you tax it within your taxable income at that 0% rate, just like we did with the savings income nil rate bands 
where they were available. OK. Now we've done examples 2 through to 5, at least I hope you have. Example 6. Now both examples 6 and 7 are not going to be difficult when it comes to dividend income. So I want to get you to tackle these on your own. But let's just see why they're not that difficult when it comes to dividend income. The real issue about these two further questions are rather more to do with the taxability of the difficult one, savings income. But here in example six, Daisy received a salary. Now again, as you analyse a question, salary, what type of income is that? It's non-savings. They've also given you PAYE. If you get given the PAYE figure, then there's a very good chance that this is going to be the requirement, income tax payable. But make sure you've read that requirement carefully. Do they just want liability? Do they want payable there? We then got bank deposit interest. That is savings income. And of course, dividend income there. But that is £1,000. Now that, as you can clearly see at 1000 is within the 2000 dividend income nil rate band. On that basis, therefore, you've got to show it as part of your tax calculation, but it's at a 0%. There'll be no tax to pay in relation to that dividend income. When you look at example 7, we up the salary here from 18850 that we had in the previous example to 36850. We have bank deposit interest of 12,000 and dividend income still of 1,000. Now, what this is going to do is to push the taxpayer up into higher rate. But again, dividend income won't be a problem because the dividend income is £1,000. I'd like you to work those examples as they are. And what we'll do when we come back, we'll have a quick review of those and also then suggest, well, what would have happened? If those dividend incomes of ten, sorry, of one thousand pounds in each of these two examples had been somewhat higher, how then would have taxed that additional amount? We'll check that out, therefore. But to begin with, you please have a go at example six and seven. Check out the answers in the back, and we'll pick it up from there when you rejoin us. Okay, well, here in answer to example six, you can see how we've maintained our classic format for our income tax computation. Non-savings being the employment income, savings income being the interest income, dividend income, of course, being the dividends received. Put it into our total column, get our total income. Personal allowance to be deducted. Where is it deducted from, first of all? your non-savings income. Is there enough non-savings income to absorb all the personal allowance? Yes, there is. So that brings down the taxable income made up of, well, the non-savings taxable income, I should say, to £7,000. What does that mean? It means that all of it is in the basic rate band and therefore will be taxed, as we see there, at 20%. It also means that as that figure at 7 is at least 5,000, that there'll be no 0% starting rate band to apply to your savings income of £10,000. But because we've only got 18,000 as our total taxable income, our taxpayer is a basic rate taxpayer. What does that tell you? It tells you that on the savings income, we've got £1,000 as our savings income nil rate band. So the first thousand is taxed at 20%, as we saw, sorry, at 0%, I do beg your pardon, at 0%, getting a little ahead of myself there. And the remaining 9,000 of that 10, well, that falls entirely, of course, within the basic rate band, and therefore is going to be taxed at 20%. On top of that, as we knew from the introduction to the question itself, the dividend income was only 1,000. And whether you are basic rate, higher rate, or additional rate, the dividend income nil rate band is universally available to you. The first £2,000 of your dividend income, whatever level of taxpayer you are, benefits from the nil rate band. So that £1,000 is at 0%. Bringing us to our total £18,000, we calculate the tax liability at these rates here. Because they wanted income tax payable, we take out the PAYE figure there, 
to bring us down to the income tax payable. By now you'll have read the notes that back up what I've just said. Right, so dealing with the dividend income was no problem at all, as this stood. Well, let's therefore just change things a little to make it a bit more of a challenge there. Imagine now that your dividend income, instead of being 1,000, that that came to 10,000. So I've added another 9,000 into the dividend income. Well, anything that adds to the dividend will, of course, be added to the total. So that now will be £27,000 of taxable income. Now, it isn't going to change the taxability of your non-savings. That's still 7,000 at 20%. Your savings income, we are still at 27, a basic rate taxpayer. Therefore, it's still 1,000 at zero. And the remaining 9,000 is all within the basic rate band. It's taxed at 20%. But we've now got 10,000 pounds of dividend income to tax. Well, it's not difficult, is it? whatever you get a dividend income nil rate band of 2000 at zero percent does that cover this time all of your dividend income no it doesn't it leaves a further 8000 all of which must fall into what band the total is 27 we are a basic rate taxpayer so that £8,000, check back if you have to, to your rates and allowances, all of that part of your 10000 taxable dividend income, all the 8000 that is now not covered by the dividend income nil rate band of just 2000 it's all going to be taxed at 7.5%. Not a huge tax rate, but it will be taxed at 7.5%. Okay. Hopefully, therefore, you can see how we deal with the dividend income for the basic rate taxpayer, where we exceed the basic rate, uh, where well, we exceed, I beg your pardon, the dividend income nil rate band of £2,000. Now, all that happened in the next question with Daisy is that we increased her employment income, such as now when we calculated the total taxable income, we had 38,000. 38 is above 34,500, therefore a higher rate taxpayer. The taxable non-savings income, the first bit to be taxed at £25,000 there, that of course is all within the basic rate band, so it's all at 20%, but also what we can see is it's a lot more than £5,000, so there's no 0% starting rate band to apply to any part of that savings income, the taxable figure of savings income for 12,000. We're a higher rate taxpayer. So what happens to the nil rate band for savings income? It becomes 500. But we've got 12,000. 12 plus 25, these two figures here, 12 plus 25 is 37. That takes us above 34,500. Therefore, after taxing the 25 plus the first oops, 500 of the 12,000, there, that's 25,5. What's left within the basic rate band limit of 34,500? That is 9,000. It's in the basic rate band, so it's taxable, therefore, at 20%. But it still leaves some two and a half thousand pounds of the twelve thousand pounds in total of savings income now pushed out of the basic rate band and up into the higher rate band limit again remember when we have savings income above either the starting rate there or indeed and all the uh, savings income nil rate band anything that remains in the basic rate band is taxed at your normal 20 percent rate that you use for non-savings Anything at the higher rate band, same as the non-savings rate, 40%. So there we've got a mix of three different rates applicable to your savings income. I said these examples were more about savings income than they were about dividend income. That's what we're doing now with this add-on part of the lecture. So what we've got there for, 0%, 20%, 40% applicable to different amounts of the savings income. 
but then we add only a thousand pounds of course of dividend income all of that within the 2000 dividend income nil rate band but what about now of course if we change that number if that goes again to 10,000 increasing it by 9 therefore adding 9 to 38 47,000 pounds again just check 25 plus 12 is 37 plus 10 is 47 right what now it's not difficult is it the dividend income firstly 2000 all of the nil rate band will this now be used at the zero percent that will leave 8000 all of which very obviously is within the higher rate band again we've got nowhere near the higher rate band limit and threshold for additional rate of 150,000 pounds so all of that 8,000 look back at your rates for dividend income falling into the higher rate band that is going to be at 32.5 percent 32.5 percent there so you'd work out what that is and add it in to your overall tax calculation so there again dividend income above 2000 this time falling into the higher rate band clearly if the savings income had been lower so that the savings income all fell within the basic rate band limit it would have meant that when you tax the dividend income you'd have had the first 2000 as we see here and as it always will be at zero percent but if then you were still in the basic rate band limit, if that total was still less, having added in that 2,000, you were still under 34,500 in total at that point, up to 34,500 total, you could then go with your basic rate band of 7.5%, as we saw in the previous answer to the previous example. And of course, only then the excess in your higher rate band would be taxed at 325 so have a think about it. have a look through again those examples and I'll, we'll pause at this particular point before we take it any further well now having seen how it is that we tax the various types of income in order non-saving savings and dividend income through the various rate bands depending on not just uh, how much income you have in total but how much of each source of income you have there's just one tiny little small point that we need to uh, finish off in terms of the taxability in point of fact of a type of interest income so here in uh, again section 3.3 now moving on from what we were just talking about on dividends and the examples there on we've got the so-called accrued income scheme now you won't have heard of this but what it goes back to is an issue that you're still not yet aware of and that is if individuals acquire certain types of loan stock now, those are basically government securities or gilt edge securities or corporate loan stock, which go by the definition of qualifying corporate bonds. Now, each of those two types of loan stock, if sold, when sold, are exempt from CGT. So there's no capital gain on any increase in value of that interest bearing stock, be it government stock or be it corporate loan stock. So what that meant was that over the years and before this rule came in certain rather smart taxpayers would acquire such a loan stock and just before the interest was due to be paid which could either be on as we'll see in the example in these notes here on a six monthly basis or on an annual basis they would then seek to sell off that loan stock now when they sell the loan stock the value of it would include it would incorporate the value of the accrued interest because someone buys it the interest is about to be paid on it they will receive all the interest for the given period whether it's the last six months or 12 months or whatever it might be so what it enabled the vendor to do was to actually get the money in relation to the accrued interest because they were able to sell the loan stock at a higher value inclusive of that accrued interest and therefore treat it as part of a gain that was then exempt from capital gains tax. So there was no income tax, no capital gains tax. Clearly quite a smart move. Therefore, HMRC were not going to sit idly by and let that happen. So what they did was to bring in this so-called accrued income scheme. 
Let's have a look at how it works. And the mechanics of it are actually pretty straightforward. Uh, chapter 12 is what deals with capital gains, where so-called gilt-edged, it's just a fancy word for government securities there, and qualifying corporate bonds, which basically means corporate loan stock, they are exempt from CGT when sold. So, without the accrued income scheme, a taxpayer would be able to avoid income tax on interest income if, as we've just been talking about, the security was sold just prior to the interest becoming payable. And what that would effectively have done is to convert what would have been taxable income into an exempt gain. Nice move. However, they have now the accrued income scheme. So how does this work? For example, on the 1st of July 18, taxpayer purchased £120,000 worth nominal value, the market value depending on movement in interest rates, compared to that particular security's interest rates, the market value may fluctuate. If interest rates in the uh, big wide world go down on the market, and you've got an interest rate that's still up there, it's going to increase the value of your loan stock, because from the same investment, the taxpayer individuals, investors could get a higher return. You don't have to worry about how that changes. You'll be given the numbers. So we've got £120,000 worth nominal value of loan stock. What is the loan stock? 2.5% exchequer stock. That is a government security. So we now recognise that this is subject to the accrued income scheme. And the individual bought it at a cost of £125,000. Again, interest rate on that, therefore, does look very high, 2.5%, but maybe higher than might be available for other products, interest-bearing securities in the market. So we pay a little bit more for it. Interest on that was payable on the nominal value. Again, always the interest rate here, 2.5%, is going to be assessed and computed based on the nominal not whatever cost you might have incurred in the market when you bought it, but on the nominal value, it was payable on the nominal value at the 30th of June and the 31st of December. So remember, we bought it on the 1st of July 18. So that, therefore, was at the beginning of what would be a six-month period through to the 31st of December 18. We've held it for five months, therefore. And that, sorry, I yeah, don't know about that yet. On the 1st of December 18, we've now held it for five months at that date, the taxpayer sold the stock for £127,000, including the accrued interest. Now, the difference between what they paid for it, £125,000, and what they sell it for, that gain of £2,000 would be exempt from CGT. But of course, some of that increase in value of £2,000 simply reflects the accrued interest the fact that in one month's time, from 1st of December when sold to 31st of December, at the 31st of December, the half year's worth of 2.5% interest would be payable. So the value of 127000 for which we sold it, taxpayer here sold it, reflects that accrued interest. So what now happens is HMRC will not treat the entire £2,000 profit on sale as being a capital gain exempt from CGT. What we're going to do is to pull out of that the amount of accru accrued interest and treat it as interest income, i.e. savings income, to include on the computation for there, the relevant tax year. Well, that's received effectively 1st of December 18. That's the 1819 tax year. What are the numbers? Disposal, we said, is exempt from CGT. Under the accrued income scheme, the following amount treated as income and included, as we've just said, in the 1819 income tax computation. The nominal value, 120. Interest rate, 2.5%. The accrued amount of interest at the 1st of December was five months worth. Again, it was 2.5% per annum, payable on a half yearly basis. This taxpayer had bought at the very beginning of this six month period for which the interest would then fall due at the 31st of December from the 1st of July to the date of disposal, 1st of December, it's five months. So five months worth of interest should equal, get your calculators out and prove that for yourself, but hopefully that's £1,250. 
So that therefore, that 1250 would be pulled out of, as it were, the proceeds and treated as income. That 1250 would be savings income for the taxpayer who sold that security in the 1819 tax year. What happens to the purchaser? Well, one month later, at the 31st of December, six months worth of interest is received. Five months worth of that interest has already, through the accrued income scheme, been assessed on the uh, individual who sold that loan stock. So we're not going to double charge here. So the purchaser will receive £1,500. That's the six months worth of interest due on the 31st of December 18 but will only be assessed on £250, the £1,500 received, less what we've assessed on the seller, the vendor of that loan stock. So again, what we may face for either there, our taxpayer in the question is either the seller of the loan stock or the buyer, and we've got to work out in relation to the amount of interest there that has gone through on that security in the tax year, how much goes to the vendor, We've seen that five months worth under this scheme, and that five months is then deducted from the actual interest received, the full six months received by the buyer at the 31st of December. Small little issue, hope you see that the calculations are straightforward. It's just actually analysing all that information, understanding there at the point of sale, how much interest was had accrued from either when you bought or when was the last interest date when interest was paid through to this point? What is the accrued interest that you've not yet received? That amount will remain chargeable on the seller and will be removed from any interest received by the buyer before placing the net figures into the income tax computation of the respective taxpayers. Okay. Now, one important issue that we've seen is the deduction of the personal allowance. And up until now, we've assumed, as it, as it rightly is for the vast majority of taxpayers, that the personal allowance is just the standard for 2018-19 tax year, £11,850. But what we're going to see is that it's possible, and uh, we made brief mention of this at, uh, well, earlier on in this chapter, that when our income reaches a certain level, then we'll start to lose the level of personal allowance of 11850. It will erode, it will be abated there, reduced. And we reach a certain higher level, and then by that point it's all gone. How does that system work? Right. The personal allowance, as we know, is a level of tax-free income. It's available to UK taxpayers, deducted from net income, to derive taxable income. We've done this now many times before. And as you've seen on the pro forma computation and in the exercises you've done, it's deducted in terms of your analysis columns. Firstly, non-savings, followed if necessary, seldom is, but by then moving to savings, and finally, dividend income. The normal allowance, 11850 for the tax year. However, and here's the bit that we've got to be aware of, if an individual's, here's a new term, there's going to be lots of terms for us to learn, I'm afraid here, adjusted net income. But if an individual's adjusted net income exceeds £100,000, there is the income limit, a figure that is given to you on your rates and allowances page, by the way, that where it exceeds 100000 the personal allowance is then reduced by so you don't fall off a cliff whereby you go over 100,000 and you lose the whole personal allowance. What happens, it will gradually be reduced as the income gets more and more higher and higher above the cutoff level, the adjusted net income limit there of 100,000 pounds. How does that work? Well, we pick up our adjusted net income. We'll define that in a moment, minus 100,000. So what's the excess of the taxpayer's adjusted net income over the income limit of £100,000? And we take 50%. We take half of that. And that, therefore, is going to be the reduction in your normal personal allowance of what would otherwise have been £11,850. So if you've got adjusted net income 
of £110,000, well there, 110 minus 100, that of course would equal 10 times 50% or a half if you prefer, is 5, i.e. £5,000. So we would now reduce the £11,850 personal allowance by 5000 Take 5 away from 11850 you'd have 6850 again if my mental arithmetic is serving me well there. So you'd get a personal allowance of just 6850 Now what it means is, with a personal allowance of 11850 and we're effectively reducing there the personal allowance by one pound for every two pounds of adjusted net income above the £100,000 limit. For every two pounds, we're reducing by one pound. We had here a figure 10,000 above the income limit. Half of that reduced by one pound for every two pounds in excess is a £5,000 reduction. So once we get up to 123,700, now you think about it, 11,850 times 2, that would be 23,700. So when you get to 123,700 of adjusted net income, that figure or higher, minus 100,000, is going to be at least 11,850. And on that basis there, so t take half of that, that figure is, that reduction is going to be at least 11,850. You can't go below zero, you don't get a negative personal allowance. But you're going to lose all of your personal allowance there. So once adjusted net income is 123,700 or more, personal allowance is reduced to nil. Again, what we're likely to find, of course, is it's something in between 100 and 123,700, like we've done there. Once you've got it at 110, that was a £5,000 reduction. 11,850 minus 5,000 left us with 6,850. But this adjusted net income, now we know what net income is, we've seen it on our income cap tax computation. Net income is total income, less any qualifying interest payments and any trading loss reliefs. Just look at your pro form back on page five. We've seen that. Again, we'll talk more about those potential deductions later. What do you mean by adjusted net income? What's the A stand for? Well, obviously it's the net income that we start with less. And here's a couple of terms now that we're not yet familiar with. Now we'll talk about the detail of the tax system and how it deals with these issues later on within this chapter. But all you've got to do at this point in time is to recognise the label. That if you are told that we have gross personal pension contributions or we have gross gift aid payment figures, when you see those amounts, we'll talk about how you calculate them for yourself later, but any such gross personal pension contributions or gross gift aid payments there, they are deducted from net income to give us adjusted net income. Now, of course, anything that reduces the net income down, a figure that would otherwise have been in excess of 100,000, will reduce the amount of restric restriction reduction in that personal allowance. Like up here, if your net income was £10,000, but you had £4,000 worth of gross personal pension contributions, then you take that four away from the 110. So that would now only be 106 minus 100. That would be six times a half. That therefore would just be a £3,000 deduction from your personal allowance rather than five. So anything that reduces that adjusted net income for this purpose is obviously going to be good news. If, of course, our net income is already below 100000 it's a moot point. It is irrelevant there. So adjusted net income, net income, figure we already know on the income tax computation, less these figures. These figures will never of themselves feature on that income tax computation. You go back, and look, go back and look at the pro forma. You do not see mention on that pro forma. You will never see on the face of the income tax computation either of these two items. Gross personal pension contributions or gross gift aid payments. 
However, they may still have a very important role to play within the income tax computation. Here, for example, by limiting any restriction that the taxpayer may otherwise have suffered on their personal allowance. Or as we'll see it later, it may allow more of the income that is to be taxed to be taxed at basic instead of higher rate or higher rate instead of additional rate. What it will do in these gross forms, either of these two items, they're both treated the same, but whatever is that gross figure, that would serve to extend either the basic rate band limit of 34,500, the basic rate band limit of 34.5, and the higher rate band limit, if relevant, we extend that higher rate band limit of 150 by the same gross personal pension contributions or gross gift aid pounds. Now I'll show you how to do that later. All you've got to realise here is if you have either of these two items, learn those terms, then you deduct them from net income to give you adjusted net income. You then compare that adjusted net income with the income limit of 100,000 to work out, if relevant, any restriction within the uh, computation of the personal allowance. So here we go, we've got an example, and what uh, you've got to do here is to compute income tax payable, payable note, for 1819. What are we told? Employment income. Employment income equals non-savings. 108,000 in 2018-19. Now 108, of course, well that's bigger than £100,000. Bigger by 8,000. We don't have any other income, but of course because they've asked for income tax payable, because we have employment income, then there's going to be PAYE. And what has been deducted in relation to this year under PAYE? 33,130. So we've got to work out, therefore, it's very simple income tax computation. There's only one source of income, it's non-savings, it's 108. No other sources of income there, no deductions from total income. So the employment income is 108, the net income is 108. Are there any gross personal pension contributions or gift aid payments being made? No, there's not a mention of that. So adjusted net income is £108,000. Does that exceed 100? Of course it does. Therefore, by how much? £8,000. Take 50% of that, half of that, half of 8 will be £4,000. That is the reduction in the personality. It will reduce the 11850 by that £4,000. I'd like you, therefore, to have a little go at that exercise. You don't need me to do that for you. You don't need to put Again, both are non-savings for your salary, your employment income, and also a total. There's only one figure to deal with. Save yourself a bit of time. Work that through. Look at the answer in the back, please. Then come back and join us. OK, well, hopefully no great problems for you there. Again, I told you not to bother with all the analysis columns if you're dealing with that. This would be, say, an objective testing question. You've got to get the answer as correctly, well, correct, and as quickly as you possibly can. So we're not going to worry about uh, presentation. For section C, written response questions, of course, constructed response, then you've got to do it properly. So here there's one source of income, it's non-savings income, it's 108. 108,000, therefore, is both employment income and total income and net income. But net income is 108, it exceeds 100,000. It exceeds it by £4,000. Therefore, as you'll see here, hopefully you've already seen it, you restrict the normal 11,850 by the £4,000 reduction. Revised purse allowance, 7,850, in it goes. And then we proceed to tax our taxable income, all of which is non-saving. So it's an easy calculation to do. 34,500, the basic rate band at uh, 20%. What's left over up to your total taxable income of just over 100,000, that's 65,650. Well, hopefully there, check the numbers again, please, at 40%. Work out your income tax liability, take out as given and required the uh, PAYE to end up with your income tax payable figure. Thank you very much, job done.
Okay, now if you go back to the uh, notes, there's two further examples that I want you to do between now and when we meet again. Um, if we just look at those and see the nature of it, and again, you should be able to make judgments now just by looking at the information. So let's see what we've got. So it's income tax liability that we need, trading income, that is non-savings, bank interest, that is savings, dividend income, that is obviously dividend income. Now then, in terms of the personal allowance issue, 130 plus 40 is 170, plus 36 is 206. Are we going to have any personal allowance available here for our hero, Ken? No. Adjusted net income is quite clearly above that cut-off figure of 123,700. Now, because we're above 123,700, it means there that there is no personal allowance. By the time you get to that point, using your abatement, your restriction calculation, you'll be down to zero available personal allowance. You will have reduced the allowance by the full 11,850. So there's no personal allowance. Again, we don't need a calculator to do that. We can see it. We can see that there's non-savings income of 130. There's no personal allowance. All of that is taxable. All the interest income is taxable at the various rates. The dividend income is fully taxable. There's no personal allowance to deduct. So what do we tax first? That. What will you do with it? Basic rate, the rest of it, most of it at higher rate. Then next, the interest income. There's no starting rate band. Again, look at the amount of non-savings taxable income. There's no 0% starting rate band. Will there be a savings income nil rate band? Usually there has been. But what level of taxpayer are we here? 130 plus 40, 170 plus 36, 206. You're an additional rate taxpayer. What does that tell you about any savings income nil rate band? Tax accordingly. With dividend income, it doesn't matter that all of this dividend income is in the additional rate or any other rate band, you get a full 2,000 dividend income nil rate band. The rest of it, the other 34,000 there of taxable dividend income, well, clearly that will lie in the additional rate. You'll apply the correct rate. So you should be able to set that out, do the calculations as we've always done, and then check that through with the answer. What have we got here? Trading income assessment, 102. Received bank interest of £4,000. Now, again, we can see that that figure of income that we have is between 100,000 and 123,700. It's obvious what it is. 102 plus 4 is 106,000 pounds. That exceeds the limit by 6,000. Half the six, you've got a 3,000 pound reduction in your personal allowance. Take that away from 11,850. What will you then do with that personal allowance? You'll apply what's left, all of it, to your non-savings income. It will clearly use it, and clearly there's far more than £5,000 of taxable non-savings income. So there's no starting rate bound for your savings, your interest income. What level of taxpayer are we? 102 plus 4, less your personal allowance, your taxable income, will leave you as a higher rate taxpayer. Do you get a savings income nil rate band if you're a higher rate taxpayer? Well, again, I hope you can answer that particular question for yourself there. And you proceed to deal with it and the taxability then of any remaining interest income at the relevant higher rate. Right. You therefore perform those exercises, check out your answers in the back, and we look forward to again to seeing you next time.